Church of What's Happening Now, baby. Sunday edition. It's the Catholics today, except for Lee. He's, he's a pseudo Catholic and shit. What's going on, baby? I'm Jewish. That's basically Catholic. No, it's not. No, what's the difference? You don't have the 12 stations of the cross. We have Passover. No, it's not the same. All right, tell this fucking guy. They, they started it. They started it. They started the 12 stations of the cross. <laughs> it's basically you and shit. That's how you know when you're Catholic. When you, I told my wife. My wife's like, well, I don't understand. I go, listen, when you go to church and you look at the 12 stations of the cross, if you're fucking moved, you're a Catholic. If it brings a tear to your eye, you're a Catholic. If not, it ain't going to work out for you. <laughs> go across the street and hang out with the Protestants or whatever they're cracking, whatever they're doing, or the Jews, whatever you want to do. But that's the thing. My wife didn't even know what this 12 stations of the cross are. When you go to a really powerful church and you look at Jesus up there and then you look around and you see the... It's when Pontius Pilate comes, gets him, then he That's punches it. him. They, they break down the beaten into 12 rounds, don't they? Something yeah, like they them. do. They sh- and they show him, get handed. So that's the 12 stations of the cross for you non-fucking Catholics out there. My main man in the house today, Big John McCarthy. What is up, brother? What's up, beautiful? Dude, thank you for having me, man. Oh, my God, we've been dying to have you. How'd you get the weekend off from Brazil? You know what? I just got lucky. <laughs> Everyone thinks it's like, Oh man, how come you not? How come you don't go down? Because it's a long freaking flight, and you're on that plane, and then you got to come right back. And it's like everyone thinks you're on vacation there. It's like no, you get to go to a, a airport, fly on the plane to Brazil, go to a hotel, get to an arena, go from the arena back to the airport, get on the plane, go back. What's the travel time from LA to Brazil? About fourteen hours. That's yeah. heavy duty. Oh, it's yeah. long. Plus Which, getting through customs. Oh, That's yeah. only the time in the in the air. Oh, yeah. And what's the breakdown? There's two flights or just two one flights? Flight? Usually, yeah. It's usually either go to Miami or to Houston. Okay, that's... When, uh, so you're from there down to Rio or Sao Paulo, depending upon where you're going. But it's, you know, after being on a flight, it's usually like four hours to, you know, Houston or Miami is that four-hour part. And then you get your little bit in between and then about a 10-hour down to, you know, Brazil. Long flight. You get up and walk around. I don't, I don't fly internationally. I just don't. I, I don't think I'd have the patience. I started making it on the trip to New York and back. Like, I'm really good because you bring the iPod, you bring the, the computer, it. you bring a book, you bring a pencil, you bring a piece of paper. Hopefully they have a movie. But that 14-hour stuff, I don't know how people do it sitting there. Oh, I've only done it once to Israel, and it was only like 12 hours, 11 hours. It's tough. And especially like an international sucks. flight when odors start popping up and shit. That's what'll kill me. <laughs> Some motherfucker brings hummus on the flight. Somebody takes their shoes off. You're on that motherfucker 10 hours, and you feel like going up to the person with the shoes off and going, dog, you got to put those fucking dogs back on. Isn't that, what, uh, isn't that what John Candy tells Steve Martin on planes, trains, and automobiles, and he takes his shoes <laughs> off? And he goes, whoo, my dogs are on fire. <laughs> And then if you're sitting in coach, like I was sitting in coach, I didn't sit first class. It's, no, it's no, the same I, thing. It sucks every. No, that's where you're at, man. You know, it, look at first class, business class. It's all right. You you can you get all the movies and stuff. You can stretch out. You're always in coach. You're always in coach. And you're a big dude. It's not like dude, you're. Like, it sucks. It's horrible. You know, especially if you, at least United has got economy plus, so you know it gives you that little extra bit. So my knees aren't getting crushed by somebody most of the time. But coach is horrible. But they give you. The uh, economy plus, but then they put handles on it. Oh yeah. So if you're sitting there by yourself, I gotta sit like a fucking kid in a baby seat. <laughs> Take the handles off. So you gave me the six extra, extra inches. United's great. United's got a good deal. United will give you extra legroom package mixed with the security package for sixty bucks. So you could pat, you could get a first class security to go through first class instead of going through coach. So they they combine it. It's like sixty nine bucks for the first class and the the extra legroom. It's not bad, because that's the whole thing about flying, is oh, waiting yeah. in the line. That's the whole thing about flying. It's not anything else that bothers me. I already have it in my head. I'm on a flight. I'm doomed. For people who fly once or twice a year, like like I do, it's not that big of a deal. For But for you guys, if you're flying once or twice a week, every that's weekend. hours a week that you're losing. I could do it every weekend. And it's weird when I have to do it and not pick up a check. That blows for me. Like, if I have to do something on a personal level, like go to New Jersey just to see family, that blows. That's unimaginable to me, getting on a plane and not getting a, not not getting a paycheck. Paid. It's unimaginable to me. So when people go, come visit, fuck you. I got to do comedy there. If not, it doesn't pan out for me because I can't just sit on that plane and just for no reason. Vacations? I don't have vacations when I stay here and go to Santa Barbara and go to that place that has a lasagna with the meatball in the middle. Have you gone there, Mrs. McCartney? Fucking tremendous. You understand? I like taking pictures. Dude, in fact, give me my phone real quick. I, I 
take pictures of the people that I end up having to sit next to oh, in, in coach on these long flights. And some of them are classic, man. Here, I got to show you one. Dude, That's hysterical. Dude, That's what Sebastian awesome. does. Awesome. My friend Sebastian goes through the airports and takes pictures of people, and they have their feet up with no socks on and slippers, and he goes, aren't you embarrassed? <laughs> he puts little <laughs> captions on them. I would be, I don't know how the fuck people do it. No. The victims and coach, and all the way in the back, like an Expedia, when you got to sit in the back, like you got a good price, but they put you in the back with people with handcuffs on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I kind of love those. Or they, sit, or they stick you right next to the toilet. Oh, God, that's, that's awesome. horrible. Yeah, you're just next to the toilet for only like 10 hours. It's just, it's, you know, one of the most amazing things. It's they like, just put me next to a toilet, but the whole row was empty. <laughs> so I sacrificed. That's not bad. That's not bad. If I had the whole like row was empty, I might even sit next to the toilet for a while. Yeah, it's not bad. Because I can't sit inside no more. I get too much anxiety, especially up in the air. My nose clogs up. Oh, really? So I can't breathe. So if I'm sitting inside, I start panicking. I get panic attacks. So I got to sit on the outside. So last time I flew, they had me somewhere. They had me in a good seat, but inside. And I go, don't you have anything outside? She goes, we have the last row in the plane all to you. I go, fuck it. Book it, bitch. <laughs> I sat there all the way from Miami in the back like a doctor listening to music, scratching my fucking feet and everything. Did yeah, you I find? Did you find this smoking Joe Frazier? I'm, I'm, I'm seeing. I'm seeing my granddaughter. <laughs> I'm getting nothing with pictures of the ugly people. <laughs> it's. Uh, I, I've just listen. Flying blows. It does. Flying really it's sucks for the American consumer. The person who doesn't know flying is fucking shocking because flying used to be something that was fun. You look forward to it. You. You got. You know. When I was a kid, I used to fly out here from Jersey. My mom would put me on a plane by myself to come out here when I was 8, 9, and 10 to see my uncle by myself to Miami too. Fuck it. And that's, even if you didn't get a first-class ticket and you flew by yourself, they put you in first class because you were a kid and they'd give you wings and a fucking captain's hat. That's cool. And first class had perfumes in the bathroom and creams. It's not like that no more. It's an adv There was a time when on a plane there was a fucking piano. Right, yeah. And you could play the fucking piano on the plane. People would play the piano upstairs. Remember, if you watch Midnight Express, it's a two-floored fucking plane. They don't have those no more. All the planes used to be two floors. So upstairs was like a little first class with a guy playing the piano with a pig eating an apple. I swear to fucking God. I swear to God. Nobody remembers that shit. Watch Midnight Express. He takes them upstairs. No, we've been on a two-seater. Yeah, on a two-seater. There, but there's no plane. There's, there's, no there's no more. No more of that shit. Now, Big John, what did you start first, refereeing or being a police officer? Oh, I was a police officer. I became a police officer back in uh, 1985. How old were you? I was 22. And what made you, oh, well, you come from a family of cops. Or yeah, my dad was a police officer on L.A. And it, yeah, it was funny because you know, I was bouncing. I was doing a lot of bouncing. And uh, I was uh, just, you know, at the time, you think you're invincible. And you do all kinds of stupid stuff. And uh, I was getting in trouble. And my dad looked at me and goes, he said, you better figure out what in the hell you're going to do in life because you're going to do one of two things. You're going to end up being a cop where you're putting people in jail or you're going to end up being in jail. So figure out which one's better for you. And I looked at him like, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. He, no, he knew. <laughs> so, you know, I met my, uh, my wife of 30 years back then and ended up figuring, you know, I need to get a job where I can freaking pay for things and stuff. And so I started trying to be a police officer and ended up working out i got on lapd that was where my dad was at he had just uh, retired and i was on it for 23 years and were you lieutenant at the end hell no man i was the, the best my, my favorite line that i would tell everybody is you know they would all sit there and say you know you, you, know, you need to promote you need to promote you need to do this and i said you know the best part about me and wh whoever was the boss at the time best part about me and daryl gates is we both have reached the tops of our careers or if it was, you know, Willie Williams or Bernard Parks, any of them. We both reached the pinnacles of our careers. I ain't going no higher. I, I really did not want to. I did not want to be a supervisor. I didn't want to I didn't want to write paper on people. I wanted to take care of, you know, people. I, I loved going out and taking care of citizens and doing things for people. That The real thing, there's all kinds of police officers. And, you know, there's good ones and there's bad ones. Just like there isn't any, you know, occupation there is there's good comedians and there's shitty ones and i've sat through some shitty ones you know and you go who told this guy he's good at this and you know there's there's ones that are, they're afraid of being a police officer no matter what they want to say they're afraid of it they're afraid of the people out there they're afraid of dealing with people and so they do everything they can to do the easy things they pull over you know 
ladies, they'll pull over, you know, old people, they'll pull over the guy that they see coming out of a business in a business suit and write a stupid ticket or something like that. And I looked at that, that's chicken shit. You know, I, I, I swear to you, I wrote about five tickets in my career and they were all to gang members. <laughs> and it was, I, I, if I stopped someone, I would stop you to put you in jail. I would, if I thought that I, you know, you're doing something bad. But if you were, you know, I didn't, I didn't care. If you're doing 80 miles an hour in a 50, I'd tell you, hey, you need to slow down. You know, be safe. Have a nice day. Boom. And I would never write a ticket because why am I going to ruin that guy's day or that girl's day? Why am I going to make their insurance go up? And you know what? I don't care if the city made money. I care that people are having a safe day. No one's bothering them. And I, I enjoyed going out and putting people in jail that cause problems for other people in a bad way. I enjoyed putting gang members in jail had no problem doing that i enjoyed uh if someone was terrorizing an area in a certain way or something i like trying to find them and put them away so the neighborhood was better how much of it is uh i don't know how they interact with you like if, if i've had i had a friend in high school who loved arguing with cops about he would speed and he would get pulled over and he loved it he loved arguing with them and he would get tickets and and he would get in fights with them and i've, I've been pulled over like I think three or four times i've never i got one ticket but other than that, I'm always very nice, and they usually seem to let you go. Well, you know, and, the, and this is, it's exactly what you're saying. If you're going to sit there and, you know, I don't care who you are. If I pull you over and you sit there and you say, I said, hey, you know, let me see your driver's license registration, please. You know, what's your name? Blah, blah, blah. I'll be nice. I'm going to be as respectful as I can to you. I'm going to treat you the way I would want to be treated. And if you start in with, why did you pull me over? Well, the reason I pulled you over is, you know, you're going, we'll say, 65 and a 45. No, I wasn't. I was not speeding. Well, now you're saying I'm a liar, okay? I don't lie. I don't have to sit here. I don't want to. I don't do things to people that don't deserve it. I don't want to. I'm not going to ruin your day for no reason. But don't make it to where the, you're making the police officer say, "Okay, I'll prove it to you," and they're going to write you the ticket. Because if you're asking for it, fine. The best thing you can do anytime you get stopped by a police officer is say, "How you doing, sir? You know what? I don't know how fast I was going. I was. I apologize. Here's where I was going." I did not realize that I will slow down, you know, take your time, do what you're going to do. You know, and they're going to run you because they're going to see if you have any felony warrants or things like that. But most of them will come back, and a lot of times they're going to come back and say, hey, have a nice day, slow down. And what did it cost you? It cost you a little bit of time. But if you want to sit there and challenge them, you're just proving that, you know what, you are not treating them the way they're trying to treat you. If you, you know, to get respect, you have to give respect. And that's, you know, that's the essence of life. I, I drove without a license, not because I got DUIs or nothing. I had a Colorado license, and right before 9-11, I lost it. The license got lost on a plane, and I just didn't want to go get a license. I just fucking <laughs> didn't want to go get a license, man. It's a fucking pain in the ass. It is. So from 2000 to probably 2012, I drove without a physical license. And I would get pulled over all the time and never get a ticket because I'd address the officer with respect and tell him the truth. And he told, one cop told me on the five, he goes, listen, man, you were doing 70 or 80, whatever, but, you know, you were a gentleman, I'm going to let you go, and you didn't have alcohol in your breath. That's why I don't believe in drinking booze. I do comedy. I do not drink it. I can't handle myself when there's a cop behind me, even if I don't have a gun in the car. If I have nothing in the car, nothing, drinking nothing, I'm still fucking like, why is he behind me? Last night I had a guy behind me for three fucking miles before I got on the 710. But all those times, I've never, you know, I got arrested 37 times, right? 37 times you've been arrested? Oh, oh, I, I, was on a, I was on a roll for a while. <laughs> I never heard that number. Oh, I was on a roll for a while. From 84 to 85, I'm like a half. I got arrested but let go because they couldn't get the proof, you know, like I, possession of stolen property, uh, tools, they let me go. Possession of stolen property, they let me go. I always knew a cop or, or something. There was always something going on. And there's all those arrests, I only had problems with one police officer. Let me tell you how good I was. One time I got arrested in Jersey in Englewood Cliffs, and I had a warrant in Newark. And they arrested me like at 2 in the afternoon, and I hadn't eaten lunch. So then I was 9 o'clock, and they were transferring me to Newark. And I made the cop. I, I talked to him nice. I go, officer, I haven't fucking eaten since breakfast. I'm dizzy. you got to stop somewhere. He's like, I can't do it. I go, officer, you got to keep telling you they're not going to fucking feed me all night. You can't do this to me. Where would you presume we stop? 
I go, Chan's dragging in. He goes, not in a million fucking years. You know why? Because I was doing a stake out there one night for a burglar, and we could hear the rats. <laughs> the cop wouldn't fucking pull over. He goes, that place is fucking filthy. Finally, he pulled over. He went in, ordered it for me, got it out. He let me eat it in the back seat of the car. Pork fried rice and an egg roll. That's how much respect I had for cops. And after a while, you just tell them the truth. I, uh, the cop that broke my balls was in Colorado. He was one of those cops that was Johnny American. And he would always say things to me, like little things to me in court. And I would break his balls, because at that point, that's what it had become. He was a fucking scumbag to me. But uh, I've never had a problem with a cop. Never. In my, never. I, I have. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I just don't understand how people want to argue with a cop. I, that's the last motherfucker I want to argue with. I just want to leave. The people who I've seen do it, I grew up in a very rich town. It was the, it's people who are, I'm not saying everybody, but the people I've seen do it, they like the, they like having the power because like they, they they're not worried about going to jail because they have bail money and I don't know maybe 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 that's just them but the the two or three people I've met who like doing it were very rich. When I was 18 for about a two month period, I considered being a cop. In the uh, in the early 80s, there was a big a big hiring in the early 80s in the East Coast in Miami. There was a big hiring for minority police officers, and they went after them. If you remember in Miami, they had the river cops. Oh, yeah. The four cops that were fucking throwing people in the ocean, yeah. pulling them over, taking their drugs, and killing them and shit. Drugs and money. Money, because yeah. they couldn't do enough background checks fast enough. They, they didn't look at juvenile records. They didn't know that these fucking kids were, were crazy. But the same thing happened in my hometown, where a handful of kids that were crazy got became cops. It's the same thing out here. That's what oh, happened. That's what that was Rafael Perez and all of them and, and you know, the Rampart scandal and everything. Why do you think LAPD gets such a bad rap? I, my girlfriend grew up out here <laughs> and she she said the sheriffs are pretty cool and she grew up in Inglewood where like there's a lot of like the police I used to go drop her off and there were drug dealers who were just always out. It was like a store and the police station was a few blocks away and they're just like they, just, they don't come around here for that. And and she, she has... She's, she wants to be a lawyer, but she says LAPD has a horrible reputation. You know, they have recently really gotten, there's all kinds of stuff that goes into everything. And, you know, they try to get so politically correct that you lose your effectiveness in what you're doing. And when, again, this is the whole point. When the citizens know that, well, the police aren't even going to come around here, well, that's the citizens are also the idiots selling the narcotics at times and they're the ones that you know are bringing the people that are buying the narcotics and the way the people buy the narcotics is to break into the home and steal that person's you know tv or computer and go out and sell it and to get the money for their stuff and so it's just it's a vicious cycle that is going on and you have got to have people knowing you're going to be there to cause them a problem because if you're there to cause them a problem, they're going to try to go somewhere else. They're going to try to do it in another way. They're not going to try to stop, mm -hmm. but they're going to get out of that one area and then, you know, move on. You find where they're going and start to cause them a problem again. And that's what police work is about. Police work is, is not about, you know, going out and stopping just anybody on the street. It's about being smart, watching, going up, doing what we call OPs and observation, watching the people, watching what they're doing. If I, if I go and I stop someone on the street for we'll say you know and I'm stopping because I think they're a narcotic seller. Trust me, I've been watching them. I know where it's at. I'm not an idiot. I'm not going to sit there and just stop them for you know nothing. So I can't put them away. I'm going to sit there and either have information from someone that has told me exactly where they put it at, or I've watched them, seen where they put it at. And so you know, I've had it where you know guys will take them. There's grass and they'll they'll, have, they'll pull up the grass and they'll be three feet underneath the grass. And so as as you're there, you would never know unless you went and watched them. You watch them, you sit there, and all you got to do is watch them for a while, watch them do a cell, boom, go in there, pop. That's not mine. You're right, it's not yours. Yes, it is. I watched you go there. Too bad. So now it is my word against yours. My whole thing is, I don't lie. There's no reason to lie. If you, if you tell the truth, it never changes. When you tell a lie, you need to then start telling more lies to try to cover that lie. So tell the truth. If you can't, if you can't catch the person that day, then you don't catch them that day. He said yeah. something very interesting in the beginning that I was going to talk to you about, and you brought it up. I think that, and I don't think it's just L.A. I think I travel, and you travel. It's the fucking country as a whole. Uh, I think the social uh, shortness has even caught up to police officers. When you go in and you see a cop and you pull over, you see a cop and you ask him for directions, they look at you like you're from another planet now. 
You can't talk to an L.A. cop. You ever say, like, good afternoon to cops when they're eating lunch at Boston Market? They look at you like, why is he talking to us? Why, I can't fucking say hello to four fucking cops? I'm trying to give you the respect you deserve. You're outside. You know, most people look at you like you're, you're this for the community. It's like my friend says. My friend's a detective in Jersey. because they all come crying for Papa when they get bit slapped. But when I drive down the street and they're having a good time, they give me the finger and shit. But when they get bit slapped, they're all crying for fucking Papa. Uh, they have forgotten what. I grew up with cops, with B cops in New York City, where you got to know them. And they got to talk to you, and they got to walk See, home with you. That's the difference, though. See, back, you know, in, in when I came on, you know, the guys that I was I was learning from were guys that had 20 years on the department. They'd been there. They'd done all these different things. Guys walking beats in New York. The one thing about New York, New York is when you look at the area, it's small. But the amount of people in it is huge, and the amount of, you know, officers they have is huge, too. But those officers are responsible for a very small area, but they get to know everybody. They get to know everybody. They know what everybody's doing. They know the guys that are doing the stupid stuff, and they'll sometimes sit there and say, hey, get out of here. But they don't, they're not going to take – their whole thing is to make sure that everyone is just kind of flowing together and society is working. And those guys can tell you things based on experience that what has happened recently as we get into this you know, you know, I don't want to say it's not an affirmative action, but it's an, almost an affirmative action on everyone. It's, it's like AYSO soccer. Oh, everyone should get to play. That's bullshit, okay? It's not everyone gets to play. It's, you know, the best people should go forward, but there needs to be time in that. So what we have is we get a bunch of – I used to, you know, teach for the department near the end of my career, and I'd get a class of 50 people. And out of that 50 people – I would have 35 that had some type of degree, BS, BA, Masters, MBA, or PhD becoming a police officer. And I'd have about 15 that were military or didn't have any kind of real experience, high school education, but you know, got, got in. And the people that had the, the degrees the problem with them was is we have done things and we have made it to where everyone is oh it's okay we're going to help you out we're going to do things for you we're going to everyone should get a chance to play and when i grew up when you grew up i would go outside at seven o'clock in the morning after feeding myself because you know no one was there to make me you know breakfast i fed myself and on the weekends and I would go out and I'd get on you know, a bike if I had that or a skateboard and I'd go to my friend's house. And I just knew that I had to be home at 6 o'clock at night for dinner. And if I wasn't home, I was going to get my ass beat. But I would go out and I'd go with my friend Vince or my friend Ken and we'd go out and we would make decisions all day long. Most of them really bad. Most of them are really screwed up. But we would make those decisions and then we would have consequences based upon the decisions that we made. And we learned how to make a decision but the problem with kids now is even my kids growing up you know my wife would sit there and you know ron wanted to play with bobby so my wife would call bobby's mom ron wants to play with oh yeah bobby wants to play with ron well we'll bring ron over and he'll be over there in a half hour great we take ron and we drop him over at bobby's house and bobby's mommy's there to make sure that everything's going right and if they're going to go someplace bobby's mommy's going to go with them and they don't have to make a decision at all because it's all being done for them they don't make any decisions and so they don't know how and so then we get all these people that are all educated who come into an academy and i put them in a hard situation i'll put them in a thing i'll make a decision now go and, and they want you to give them the answer and they can't do it and they are then they'll make it through the academy i try to get rid of them but they'll make it through the academy and they're great test takers so then they'll elevate themselves without knowing how to do the job because they don't really do the job. They just take tests. And with those tests, after two years, they're a sergeant. After five years, they're a lieutenant. And they don't know how to grab their ass with either hand. And that's the problem with most departments today. You get all these people. They're very educated, but they don't know how to do police work like the old people did. Do you think that's not naming any incidents, but anytime there is an incident, do you think that's a main part of the problem? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a big part of the problem. Absolutely. 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 Look, there's all kinds of ways to do police work. Here, here's, the, here's the thing. You can look at, you know, I'm not, and I don't know exactly what happened. We'll say, you know, you got the Michael Brown incident. People can sit there and say what they want. 
Michael Brown attacks a police officer. He goes inside of the car. He gets shot inside the car. His thumb comes off and he steps back. And this is witnesses. And this is all in. If you look at the true records of it and he decides to attack the officer again and the officer shoots. Now I'm telling you, would I have shot him? No, I wouldn't have. But here's the difference. I have certain rules that I lived by. I would shoot at what I know, not at what I think. That's a weird statement, but that's the truth. If I know that he is a deadly threat to me, he has a weapon that can take my life, I'm going to shoot you. I'm going to drop you, and I'm going to end your ability to hurt me. I'm not trying to kill you. I'm trying to stop you. Most police officers live on the, the premise that people will respect the badge. They'll respect the power of the badge that, oh, it can take their freedom away and put them in jail. And it will a lot of the time. But people expect police officers to be these, they're all educated in the law, they're psychologists, they'll handle all of your personal you know, domestic dispute problems, they can all fight. Bullshit, they can't. Most of them can't do anything. So when I look at someone, you know, as simple as it is, you'll see police officers coming up on cars and they'll walk up on a car. I will tell you, anytime a police officer walks up on the car, the person that's in the car has them. I'll kill the police officer every time. I'll, I can show you how. I used to teach it. I used to do it. There's no way for the officer to win if the person really wants to get go after him. Now, most people are good people. They're not going to go after the officer. So the officer relies on that fact. The second part is officers don't want to get into physical altercations. Why? Well, because there's a gun involved. No matter if it's the person who's got one, he's got one. So they don't want to get in, you know, tear up their uniform. They might not be able to fight real well. So they're afraid of getting in that physical altercation. So they'll keep people in a car where they don't know anything about what's inside the car, which is the real danger, instead of pulling them out of the car, putting them up here. And so now the person, if they want to be, they want to attack the officer physically, they can. Okay, attack me. Go ahead. That's my job to be professional and learn how to be better at doing certain things than you. And if you're not doing those things as a police officer, then you're not being smart about being professional. There's life insurance policies for everything. Learning how to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or fight or know how to actually handle yourself if you have to. For a police officer, it's a life insurance policy. That's what you're talking about. So when you're not doing it, you're saying you're lazy. And a lot of people are lazy. Uh, now, <clears throat> for me, growing up, that neighborhood cop <clears throat> became my uncle. He was also a deterrent. He also, by right of the neighborhood, if you acted up, he'd fucking kick you in the ass <laughs> and take you to your house and knock on the door and say, excuse me, your son disrespected me and I gave him a kick in the fucking ass and then your mom would give you a bat a bit slap in front of the cop and it was understood and your mom on the way out would go, by the way, he ever disrespects you, knock him the fuck out. Now you had a green light. Now you know if you played hooky. This guy, you know, we had, and, and it's funny because I was blessed. I have been blessed with the best police officers ever around me. As a kid, we had a guy look like Agarn from F Troop. <laughs> Chucky McGreen, he calls in, his uncle. And we would, he was an all-state basketball player. So no matter if he was a cop or not, he was still a basketball player. So we played basketball with 13, and he'd pull up. We'd go, what, you want to play hoops? And he'd go, I don't have time. We did that to him until one day he goes, you little motherfuckers. He took the belt off. He put it in the trunk of his car. He took his police shirt off and played hoops. We would make him play hoops. That's then good. We'd, then we'd abuse him. Don't come here no more with colored socks because he would wear colored socks. You're going to cut yourself. You're going to poison them. We all go to murder. We would torment him. We had another cop, a kid that we were friends with, and we became friends with his father. His father was a no-nonsense guy. His father would fucking backhand you. His father would backhand his son at school with his arms folded. He would just go, and the son would drop, and then he'd pick him up again. And one night he caught us dining and dashing. They sent him. The Chinese guys were waiting for us to kick the door down. We, we ate, and we're ready to run, and they locked the door on us. So we're like, the cops are on their way. When we see Mr. Vanacek, we're like, shit. He came in. He pulled us all together. He goes, I'm not going to take you little motherfuckers to jail. Give me all your money. We're like, we got no money. He goes, okay, I'm going to pay the $40 tab for you guys. But at 1 o'clock tomorrow, if I don't have this $40, I'm putting a personal warrant on you. He goes, I'm going to knock the fuck out of all four years. At 12 o'clock, we were there with his $40. That's good. They meant something different to us. They were somebody else to us. I don't see that anymore. No, it's they have a Taekwondo school. 
on Hollywood Boulevard. It's run by cops. Is that still run by the cops there? Psh, I don't know. On Coenga? Yeah. yeah it's really? a little place with a bad. It's like a PA. I grew up a PAL. Yeah. When I came from Cuba, I was a PAL guy. In the corner, they, they would take you to the police station and make you shoot a 32 or a 22 and then give you the bullet to take home. Oh, yeah. The they case. give you the fucking target. They teach you how to shoot pool. They took me to Detroit. You know, I'm a PAL guy, so I, I got it. Growing up, I really got it. Well, you said when you when you earlier you said that some a lot of cops who trained you had twenty years experience. Yep. Is there a lot more turnover now? People stay for like five years. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah really? Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, you get a lot of people. There. It's not. It is not the same thing. And you you just the other part is it used to be you know back a long time ago working patrol there was a, there was a certain amount of honor to it that you were the guy out there actually doing the job you were you were dealing with the public you were. And then it got to the point where your supervisors were saying, why, why are you still working patrol? Why are you working patrol? What are you doing? Why don't you, why don't you work the special agent? Why don't you go do this? Why don't you be a detective? Why don't you be a sergeant? And it, they made it to where if you're the, the officer that just stays in patrol, well, obviously you're, you're you know, not that smart. And they, they, put a, they tainted it, and it, they made it to where the people that are really good are always trying to go other places because... That's what everyone's expecting. Patrol is a great place to be. Now, it can get old for anyone, but it, when you start having two-year police officers training zero-year police officers, you know your department's got problems. You did the 20 years? I did 23. And what's the, I know you wouldn't know this, but what's the average now? People do five years and they're like, I don't want to be a cop no more. Well, I mean, you get a lot of turnover, but you get a lot of guys going all the way. You know, my, my sister's been a police officer now, and she's got like 31 years on. She's on L.A. County Sheriff's. She's a lieutenant there. She's been there forever, you know. And, and you know, it's been a great job for her. She's done a, you know a lot. She does commercial crimes now. She's super smart. She knows what she's doing. What's commercial crimes? Commercial crimes is like you know, um, you get people that go in and they're embezzling money from a business, or they're you know, people are coming in and they're you know, doing things that they shouldn't do, taking money that shouldn't be taken, and the, finally the owner, and I, I've been one of those owners, you know, realizes I'm being ripped off. And then they go and get all the paperwork and start doing all the background to get, here's how the person's been stealing, this is how long they've been doing it, this is where the money's come from, this is how much the total is. And sometimes they go after the person, sometimes they don't. You know, unlike a lot of felons and a lot of people in society right now, I've never, ever, ever, had any apprehension towards police officers. Uh, I've seen good cops and bad cops. You know, my mother had a bar in Union City. A cop would come in every week for an envelope. His name was Chino. Come in with his little outfit on. My mom would give him an envelope and a drink. If something happened, he was always the first cop on the scene. If your window broke, he went there and sat outside so nobody broke into your business. You know, I, and I never had a problem with him. I've seen other cops that came in and broke my mother's balls at the bar. And that dude ended up shot. The Cubans fucking shot him in 76. They just had something in the local, my local high school paper about his son's older now and whatever. I've seen him from, I've never, ever had, you know, even the Michael Brown thing, the kid in Staten Island. I've always said that unless you know the fucking job, shut your fucking mouth. Unless you know what it is to follow. The other night, we almost got caught in something. Oh, my God. Oh, shit. <laughs> and I was petrified because that's how it goes down. We saw the kid running. We were, me and him would get in our car, and we saw the kid running, and we saw the police back up and put the light on us, well, I and he followed us. We're like, oh, no. I, I just thought this guy was running. I thought he was going to catch a bus no. or something, and you're like, oh, the cops are following him. And we pulled into the alley to leave, and the cops went by with a little light. I was like, oh, fuck. Oh, shit. And then they got behind us. Did they really? Yeah, they got right behind You didn't know it. I, oh, I, I drove. I was like, they're going to pull us over. I'm going to have to put my hands out. Because they're going to think the perp's in the fucking car. Maybe he kidnapped us. He ain't going to kidnap me. But I saw him <laughs> running and shit. And I, uh, I, I've never, and I've never seen the outcry that's lately in all my years of him being in well, this country. I, it's and, everybody feels entitled. It's like, well, you know, you shouldn't, you know, no one should be stopping me. You know, I, I haven't done anything. And it's like, we do things all the time. I can tell you there's so many things, you know. It was funny because people would say, you can't stop me. I didn't do anything. It's like, here, let me make this very clear for you. Between state laws, L.A. municipality codes, all these things, trust me, they can stop you for just about anything. I mean, you, there, there's codes where you can't wash your car in the street or something. You know, it, It's ridiculous. There's so many different things. So if the officer wants to stop you, yeah, he can stop you. You know, 
it's what he does with it and the way he treats you that tells you who he is as a person and everything. But, you know, I, I just watched, you know, Dave Herman is, you know, you know, an oh, MMA man. fighter. And I like Dave. He's a good guy. And I see, you know, he gets stopped. He ends up driving, you know, multiple miles with the police behind him. Officer, if they are going to pull you over, why are they pulling you over? Well, they only know what they are going to pull you over for. They know, oh, this person's taillight is out. That's the reason I'm pulling them over. But that person in the car could have just done a robbery, could have gone and done something. And so in their mind, the, the officer knows, they know, they know I just committed the robbery. And that's why they're pulling me over. And so this is where you get that, the trust factor. Police officers are leery of people because... They don't know everything that's occurred, and they know why the, the reason they're going to do something, but they have to be careful with everybody that they do something with because if you don't take those precautionary steps, you can run into that one person that is the person that just robbed the store or is doing something that you didn't, you're not stopping them for, and now they have the upper hand on you. So you, they, they have to go through certain steps to protect themselves and make sure that everything's right. But if someone, as long as someone complies, if a police officer says, put your hands up, Put your freaking hands up. Put them up. Big deal. I'm not if putting they, them up. I'm calling my attorney. Exactly. Bitch. Exactly. What the fuck is wrong with you? You know, and, and it goes both ways. You know, I've seen it. You know, you know, police officer judge, you get down on your knees, get your, get it down on your face. There's a reason why they're doing it. It, and if it's not you, you got nothing to worry about. Now the police officers need to have some common sense too, because I can tell you, I've seen it too many times. You know, the police officer will run a car, and the car will come back stolen. It comes, you know, as it comes up on the computer, it's going to say, this is a Code 37 vehicle stolen, blah, 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 tell you the place and stuff. And as the police officer, you got to have enough common sense. What do I see driving the car? You know, if I see a, a male between 16 and 50 years old, guess what? You're getting pulled out. You're getting put on your face. That's just the way it's going to be. But when you see, you know, an elderly couple, you know, that's 70 years old in their Sunday best going to church, it's telling you someone didn't, they got their car back, someone didn't pull it out of the system. Don't take that lady and put her on her face in the street. Have some common sense. You know, and that common sense is what will lead people to not having a problem with some of the things police officers do. You gotta have common sense. I remember like in the, the early 80s, I've never, trust me, I'm telling you this, I don't like drinking and driving. Just something about it. Just something about it that it's like stealing a car. Fucking, if you get caught stealing a car, you're a fucking moron. We've had this combat. I can't get out of it. I'm in it. I'm in the fucking thing. At least that's not my wrench, officer. I didn't hit him with the bat. That was there. I don't know what happened. He fell. But if I'm in the fucking car, you got me. Writing checks. I never got that. I never got so many crimes. But one time I was in a friend. I was in the car with a buddy of mine. This fucking idiot was crazy. I loved him. In fact, his brother just hit me up on Facebook. He was crazy, but not in a bad way. And... We would go, it was freezing out in Jersey. And the cop was doing fucking 10 miles an hour in front of us. And what did Fernie do? Passes him on the right. There you and go. the cop pulls Fernie over. He pulls Fernie out. And Fernie's telling the cop, dog, it's fucking too cold for this. You're going to write me a ticket. But before the whole thing went down, I was sitting next to Fernie. The cop's like, license, registration. And I looked at the cop and I'm like, officer, arrest him. He's been drinking. The fucking cop started laughing his ass off so much. He just gave us a license to go home. Just take them the fuck home, you know? Like, that's how funny. But I've had situations when they're, they don't respond to a funny joke. Oh, yeah. And that's fucking crazy. Because <laughs> then you're That's like, crazy. <laughs> that's when, and, and like, I came up, when I got into all those problems, it was in Jersey. I got into problems when I was in Jersey. My mom had died. I got crazy. And there was one time I was in, like, in Newark and all those places. That's where those cops don't fuck around. Like, that's where I would hate to be a cop. And I know this cop, this guy kept busting this cop's balls. He was he was bleeding from every orifice in his fucking body. This guy needed 100 stitches, and they put him in his cell. This is the early 80s when there was no paper. They put, really? You're bleeding? We'll put you in the cell. Wait for court. Let the judge stitch your motherfucking ass up. And I remember going in front of the judge and watching him walk in with the chains. And you could see the drip of blood. 
all the way. They wouldn't take this motherfucker to get stitched up. Those are the things that always scared me about. Like, I never got touched by a cop, ever, ever, not even in a bad way. I always got my handcuffs put on, and they left me the fuck alone. Look at Big John. Look at me. Big John, I used to be crazy, man. How? What happens? I, my, I had a buddy who used to work on cops. I think he still does. And in cops, the thing is, they always you always see them say, tell me the truth. And would that actually help? Like, let's say I had drugs or something on me, and I told you the truth. Would it actually help or no? No. Okay. No. Just <laughs> fuck to jail. <laughs> shut your fucking mouth. That's what okay. I tell you. Shut your mouth. Just tell the cop the truth. Officer, I can't talk. I, don't, I remember one time we went fag bagging. When I was like, this was the hot thing. I don't give yeah. a fuck if somebody gets mad. You're not beating up on fags. You're beating up on perverted old men. We were like 18, and we get a good-looking guy, and we put him on his bait. In fact, the good-looking guy, his father was the chief of police. All right? <laughs> All right, and his cousin, I hung out with his cousin, and he was a mafia guy. So this is the house, the, the spectrum. They don't talk. I think the chief of police's sister, the chief of police and his sister, that's how they were related. Was was So uh, he was the chief, and the other kid I hung out with was the gangster's father, so they didn't really talk, but I hung out with this guy, and he was the bait. And one day we got pulled, the cops got us. The guy, this is the guy who was getting beat up. He was like a 50-year-old pervert or something like that. And they took us to the police station. But the one cop knew. The one cop kept looking at us weird. The one gung-ho cop kept saying, I'm arresting you guys for assault. But this one fucking cop, older cop, kept knowing. And he walked over to us later on. He goes, what really happened out there tonight? And I go, officer, this guy was trying to suck our dick. You know, hey, that's what really happened. And uh, we gave him a bit slap and stuff. And the guy goes, let me come right back. And he left for like three minutes. He came back and let us out of the cell. He's like, just don't come back and don't go up there and smack those motherfuckers. If you see them, contact me and I'll go up there. Because when I grew up, the city and the park were completely different. So the sheriff's department ran that Hudson County Park. And the sheriff's department, they were mean, but they were by the book. Like one night they pulled us over. Again, we were out there. We had a mirror, a Coke on top of the car. A mirror, like a, like the kid pulled the mirror out of his bathroom, and we had it on. That's when we used to snort coke outside. The early like 80s. a big full length like mirror, like a big on the trunk of the car, and we're just snorting blow on the trunk of the fucking car. I mean, who does this? Cop, and, well, cop walks out there. What are you doing in the mirror? No, just, just looking at ourselves. We broke it when the cop pulled up. We threw it on the floor and it broke. And he's like, "Why the fuck do you guys got a mirror out here?" Ah, oh, my buddy. And he goes, "What's going on?" Here? And there was an argument. Some guy had an argument, and the guy flagged down the cop. I'll never forget this cop coming over and going. Excuse me. He pulled the kid over. The kid's like, arrest him. Fuck him. And the, the sheriff looks at me and he goes, listen, really? Really? You're going to do this to me at a quarter to fucking 12 on a Thursday night, you fuck? He goes, you couldn't take him across the street and beat him up like any local, any, any, anybody with common sense. If you hit him here, I have to do common, I have to do paperwork. Do me a favor. Take him across the street. Do what you want to him, all right? <laughs> I mean, that's, and you shouldn't do that as a cop, but... He was, they, these were the guys that patrolled. They knew the area. They knew what was going on. They knew that we were going to do something. We weren't bad kids. It wasn't like we were fucking shooting cops and all like that. There was one cop, Phil Sims. He looked just like Phil Sims. I'll tell, you how God, I'll tell you how cool Phil Sims was. One night my buddy called him out, and Phil Sims says, I'll tell you what, I'll come here tomorrow at 3 o'clock. We'll fist fight in front of Nick's Pizza. They showed up the next day. Uh, Phil Sims was like 28. My friend was like 19. They fought like maybe two rounds. They got up, shook hands. And that was it. There you go. He kept torturing Phil Sims. Phil Sims said, fuck you. He fought a cop? Yeah. Have you ever seen that movie, End of Watch? They did that in End of Watch. It was a pretty great movie. No, I didn't see that. Oh, it was really good. I didn't see nothing like that. It actually is a good movie. I, I hate cop movies. It was, really? It was a good one. It actually was pretty pretty, pretty accurate. That was a, The best thing about that was when you get in a, in a, you get in a pursuit down in the south end, and that's where that was at. They, they were supposedly out in Newton, but you get in this it's all alleys and things are flying up in the air and you're busting butt through it. And it, they had the first car scene on when they had the chase, right. very accurate. It was great. Big John, before we move any further, where were you when they robbed that bank in 98, one of my first week in L.A., the North Hollywood bank robbery? I wanted to ask you that. Oh, I, you know, I was off that day. In fact, we were going up to, um, we were going up to Big Bear with my family. And I, someone said, hey, hit the TV. There's something going on. And I saw it, and I wasn't part of that at all. But I ended up doing the full investigation because I was one of the expert witnesses for it to talk about what the officers did and how they did it and what, what the suspects were doing and why it was right and what was right and wrong. Because there was a, a lawsuit later on by 
the family of Emil Montessorino, he was the second guy that died in it. He was the guy that was mostly in the car for a lot of it. Uh, they sued the department, sued uh, the city for you know, wrongful death because it was right for their husband or father or whatever you want to say to be out shooting at people. When did you retire? I retired in 2007. So, I mean, you were a police officer in this city doing some of the best fucking news in this city. You were a cop during the OJ trial? Oh, yeah. 94? Oh, yeah. You were a cop when I'll Biggie got shot? I'll tell you my OJ shot. story. You were a cop when Biggie got shot? Oh, yeah. We were at the comedy store? And, uh, well, so, because I was thinking about it. You were a cop during a lot of during things. During the riots? During, during all the, of it? During the riots. Oh, that's yeah, right. Yeah. Oh, shit. 94. That's all right. Good 90, stuff. 94, the riots. 92, Rodney, 93. 92. 92. April of 92. I had just started comedy. And I was really? doing comedy at a Chinese restaurant. And the whole thing was on. I couldn't believe, like, California. I never fucking like California. I'll never go to fucking California. Look at that guy get hit in the head with the brick. OJ. Start with the OJ thing. Oh, my God. You know, I was such a fan of OJ. Growing up, I was a fan of OJ Simpson. I loved OJ Simpson. And, uh, I mean, everything about OJ Simpson I thought was cool, man. That was the juice. And I was working in Hollywood. I was like, working Hollywood Division. I had just gotten uh, transferred from 77th Southwest Division. To, I had to go to a, what we call a new uh, bureau because there's four bureaus as far as LAPD. There's the Central Bureau, West Bureau, Valley Bureau, and South Bureau. And when you're a young officer, you go to you out of the academy, they're going to send you to a bureau. And normally you're there a year, and I was able to be down in South Bureau for almost two, and they have to transfer you out of the South Bureau, and so they put me to West Bureau, which was up in Hollywood. And so I, you know, it was a good place to go to. So I was working up in Hollywood, and I'm working morning watch. And there's an old, crusty guy. His name was Gene Ferrone, man. Big pitted face and good guy, but just kind of by the book, you know, just a, a bit of a hard ass. And he calls for an extra unit down off of Melrose and Martell. And it's about 12.30, 12.35 in the morning. And I'm right around the corner. I tell him, I'll be right there. And I pull up, and there's this black Ferrari Testarossa. And at the time, a Ferrari Testarossa was a cool car. And it's, it's got a license plate that says Juice. And I'm like, God damn, I'm going to get out. And sure enough, I see there's this pretty blonde, and there's O.J. Simpson. And I'm like, you know, come over towards Gene. He says, he goes, hey, he says, I want you to stand with him. He says, I'm going to, he says, uh, I got to talk to her. He says, but just stand and, and talk to him. Find out what he says went on. Right? I said, right, so come over here, right? How you doing? And, he, and I said, you know. What's going on? And I'm, t I'm talking to him, and he's saying, oh, man, he's, you know, I'm in the car, you know, and she's getting mad at me, and she's starting to hit. He goes, and I'm putting my hand up to try to, you know, keep her from hitting me and stuff. He goes, he says, you know, my forearm, yeah. He says, I think I did hit her in the forehead with my forearm as I told her to stop. He goes, but, you know, I'm just trying to keep her from, you know, hitting me. And he goes, and then we get pulled over, and, you know, she, she's telling him, you know, that I hit her in the, in the head and stuff. And I'm like, all right. You know, I said, look, you know, come on. You if you if you're getting mad with you know your lady or something like that, dude, pull over, get out of the car, walk, but don't you can't touch her, right? So then Gene comes and he says he goes, I'm gonna take him to jail. I said, Gene, this is O.J. Simpson, dude. You don't just take O.J. Simpson to jail. I said, well, he says he goes, let me talk to him real quick. He says, you you, you talk to her. So then I talked to the, his wife and you know go to go through the whole thing and tell him, look, you know you can't you're hitting each other. I said, you both go to jail. I said, this is stupid. You need to act like adults. And you need to work things out, and you don't touch, don't hit each other. Just talk, you know. Be adults about things. I said, do you want him to go to jail? And she goes, no. I go, well, I don't think he wants to go to jail either. So you guys need to work it out, and you need to. We'll, we'll try to explain it to the other officer. So, in the end, I get Gene to let him go, and then it's about five years later, he ended up cutting her head off. So <laughs> I'm an idiot. <laughs> but there was an arrest after that. What's that? There was an arrest after that for the domestic violence. Oh, yeah, he, he had multiple domestic right, violences after domestic that. Domestic violence. Yeah, but it was a start. And it was, you know, look at I, you know, it was because, you know, I looked at it. That's O.J. Simpson. I'm not going to screw with his career. I'm not going to make, you know, things over something that, you know, no guy should hit, you know, his wife. Should not do it. If you do it, you're an idiot. And uh, you need to grow up. But at the time, I was young, and I just looked at it. I was like, I'm not going to take O.J. Simpson to jail. That's stupid. So... You know, I did probably the wrong thing now that you look at it, and, you know, knowing what happened, but it happens, you know. You know, this, everyone thinks because people are known or they, you know, you know, they know them, they see them on TV that, you know, they live a better life, a different life. Everybody, you know, people are people. 
and people have you know anger issues people have egos people do stupid things it's just part of you know everyday life and police officers make mistakes i made a mistake that night i shouldn't have talked gene out of taking him he probably should have because maybe it would have you know changed things i don't think it would have but if it hadn't been oj do you think you would have arrested him no i honestly don't not because it's not like if she had marks that's different that's right. saying hey you're hitting her but neither one of them had marks and so there was nothing there there was an argument and look you know what I have probably the greatest marriage there is. And my wife is as great to me as anyone could be, but there's times where she can even get mad at me and I can get mad at her. And that's just, you know, that's people. So, you know, hitting and stuff, no. Words happens all the time. It's funny because at that time, the domestic violence thing wasn't... Wasn't quite as big. Wasn't quite as big. Nope. So it was getting there. If you, uh, if you didn't have any visible marks, people argue. People argue, and sometimes people get loud. I say, fuck you. Sometimes I slam the door. For a cop to come and arrest me would be a fucking heartache, you know? But that's what happens when you can't control yourself. What about uh, the riots? Well, how, where the fuck were you when all that shit went down? That's So you're a, you're on the force seven years, maybe six years. Yeah, I was and, I was working on what's called West Bureau Crash. I was working gangs at the time. And, um, There's a video of me on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, old video of me on YouTube. It was... um. You know, the, what happened with the Rodney King thing and everything, The uh, Lawrence Powell was a guy that I worked with, and I worked around him and wasn't my favorite. And you, I even told supervisors, hey, you need to set him straight. You know, he's very, he's, he's very big when people have handcuffs on. I said, you know, take the handcuffs off someone and see what it is. Don't, don't you know, I told him, you know, don't treat someone in a way that you wouldn't if you weren't wearing that badge. So if you know if, if you're gonna walk up while you're wearing a t-shirt and jeans to that person and say that, go ahead, do it to the you know, same thing. But if that's not the way you would act, then don't act that way as a police officer. So, you know, the whole thing happened with Rodney King, and then they got off, and you know, I, I knew, I knew it was gonna blow up. There was not a doubt in you know my mind. There wasn't a doubt in my partner's mind, and we got uh, called in. We were we were sent to Hollywood to work that night. And we got called uh, immediately to Wilshire. They do what's called, we call it a code alpha. That's to meet up. And we get, I get to Wilshire Station. I pull in this, the, uh, the parking lot of Wilshire Station, and we're there for five minutes. And all of a sudden, there's a, there's a shell station that's right on the corner of La Brea and um, Venice, which is very close to the Wilshire Police Station. And you hear gunshots going off there. And I hear an officer comes out with an officer needs help over uh, the radio and we jump in our cars to go out and the captain comes over the radio and says no one leave the station no one leave the station and it was like fuck you and I went out the gates of that station that and uh, see the cards coming down we get a little pursuit there's actually a, sh a little shooting that happens off of it and the games were on and honestly you know for the you know, I was there for about 20 hours that first day I had a blast all the rules were off. I, I had a great time. I'm telling you right now, people were nuts. There was, you know, there, you really had two. You had people that were trying to take was, what wasn't theirs. They didn't care about Rodney King. They didn't care about the police officers. They cared about getting freebies. They cared about what can I, what can I put in my, you know, apartment or my house that didn't belong to me yesterday. And there was those people, and then there, there was the people that were trying to keep what was theirs. And my job was to help the people trying to keep what was theirs and take care of the people that uh, were uh, doing the bad things. And all we would do is, man, we would grab hold and crush people down, and have a bus come, and they'd throw them in. There would be, we'd send one officer to write a whole report with however many people it was, and I stayed out on the streets until they called me in probably about 10 o'clock the next morning, let me go home until 6 o'clock, and I was back at work. And for two days, I had a blast. It was the greatest time I ever had as a police officer. After that, it was boring. <laughs> How long did that last, those riots? Well, the riots, you know, like I said, two days, it was really going. I mean, when I say it was going, it was, I mean, there was fires all over. They were burning, you know, all the, you know, they would loot a store and burn it. You know, liquor stores were huge for them to go into. Uh, any kind of a, appliance or electrical thing, you know, they were trying to break into. And pawn shops. You know, always going after pawns because there was guns and things. And we um, we were just going after, you know,
people that were doing the, the bad things for the most part. You know, they they would go into Seven Elevens and raid the Seven Eleven and set it on fire. But what was really starting to happen is then the fire, you know, LA, you know, City Fire is then calling even LA County Fire and then to sit, you know, put out the fires. And then they were shooting at the, you know, the fire fighters and stuff. And so the firefighters couldn't get into the fires and it was a lot going on for two days. After two days, it, it pretty well, it slowed down a lot. Would it have changed if there was the as live as internet as it was for Michael Brown would have been different? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, right? absolutely. That's what I was I mean, just thinking. You know, the internet was just brand, brand new. Brand new then. I don't even think most people even had it. AOL was like, you know, you got mail. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah, and yeah, stuff. Yeah. But it's, uh, at the time that it happened with everything, I, it would have been a different thing now. Yeah. Especially, you know, and it's not even, it's not so much the internet. It's like, it's this. You know, everywhere you go now, you know, and this is what's funny about police work and stuff. Everywhere you go, um, you know, people have a video camera. It's their phone, you know. And uh, and like I said, it's like it's no different than telling the truth. You know, treat people right. My son is an L.A. County Sheriff. Okay, now I told him don't be a police officer. He's stupid enough. He goes and does it, he, and you know he enjoys it. But you know, I tell him wear a camera. I want you to wear a camera on you. I want you every time you stop someone, every time to turn that thing on. Why? Because if you're not out there to screw people over. It's only going to protect you. It's going to show you when people say, he did this. No, I didn't. Here. And it takes care of all the complaints. And it used to be years ago, all of these, the ACLU and all these different, you know, attorneys for the defendants or whatever, would say, we want police officers to wear cameras. And a lot of police officers are like, I'm not wearing a camera. And it's like, why? If you got nothing to hide, what does it matter? And so now, a lot of departments are putting cameras on police officers. And all of their complaints are being thrown out because the officer goes and gets someone to complain about him. They have the camera. They put, show exactly what happened with that entire interaction. They go, the person's lying. And now, all of a sudden, the Association of Attorneys for Defendants now does not want police officers wearing cameras because it's costing them money because they're not getting the lawsuits. <laughs> it's like everything's about money. You know, you it, 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 Everything when it comes to police work is being smart. Treat people the way that you would want to be treated. If someone needs to be thumped, then that means that they're asking to be thumped. Thump them. But when they're done trying to hurt you, stop thumping them. You got rules. They don't. That's just the way it is. You know, and you got to live by that. You got to understand. I have to. I have to play by a certain set of rules. As long as you understand that, it's a great job. It's a. It's you know something that's very fulfilling at times, and you can do a lot of good. Or you can sit there and be a dummy and go out there and think that, you know what, you can rule the world the way you want to rule it, and you're going to end up pissing people off and getting yourself fired or put in jail. Do you think the amount of money that officers make, because no, no one makes you become a cop, so you know what you're getting into pay-wise when you sign up. That's what's but, so funny, though. <laughs> you get all these police officers, and they all want to be rich. It's like, dude, you knew what you were signing up for when you freaking did it. But do you think if they offered more money, which I know is hard because taxes are already high as high as they are yep but if they were able to offer more money they might be able to hire not i don't want to say better people but people they wouldn't have to hire the people who are doing the bad stuff i, I would tell you this the, the real problem with police departments and hiring is there's too many things that have gone on with people's rights too okay i'm i am you know I'm six foot, I was six foot four. I was 235 pounds when I was going through the academy. I was 280 pounds the entire time. I was a police officer up to 300, whatever. You know, there's certain people that they look at me and they don't even want to do the things that they're thinking because they go, it's not worth it. I might not win. But when you have a, a someone come out and say, I am three foot seven inches tall, but I have the right to be a police officer. Well, okay, yeah, I guess you do, but you have certain limitations. But courts and everything is now saying that this person at three foot seven can do everything that the six foot four person is. Well, they can in certain ways. My wife was a police officer. I'm telling you, she's smarter than I am. Okay? She had a lot better attitude than I had. But there was that one to two percent. There's no way in the world she could deal with the way I could deal with it. It's just, you know, she, and she knew. And I, I tried to teach her when she was going on. Being a police officer is about being smart. But, you know, I can tell you, you know, when they're, when they're in the academy, you know, they're, they're taking her and they're putting her through all this training and stuff. 
And they're tra- it's almost like going through the military. They're going to break you down to try to build you up and tell you that you can do these things. And it got to a point, you know, at one point, you know, she, she still thinks I'm an asshole for it. But, you know, she was getting to that point. She thought that she could actually do physically certain things to people. And I said, and I told her, come here, choke me out. I'm going to sit here. Choke me out. Come on. They, they told you that you can, you can choke anyone out. Choke me out. And, you know, I sat there and, and she got mad at me. But that was the point of you need to understand the truth. There are certain things that you can't do, you know, and to sit there and to say that anybody can choke another person out, that's just not true, okay? That's just not the way it is. If someone really knows how to do it well, they have a chance against someone that doesn't have skill in how to either defend it or anything. Yeah, there's always that, but there's always somebody out there that can beat you. And if you think that everybody is created equal, they're not. And, you know, you need to be smart enough to realize there are limitations in everything. There's limitations when it comes to being a school teacher and what certain people can do and what certain people can't. Everyone can do the job of teaching, but is everybody the same? No, and it's the same with being a police officer. And departments are forced to hire people that probably shouldn't be police officers. And then when they're going through academies and when they're failing tests that are absolutely important to public safety, but that person has the right to have an attorney go to court and say, no, they shouldn't have been fired because it's not the real world in the academy. And the real world is what's going to take it. So what you're saying is you want to put this person out on the street and let them do this in the real world. So then when they actually do either shoot someone they shouldn't have shot or what's worse to me is they don't shoot somebody who needs to be shot because they are taking the life of somebody else. And that's what really happens is then you allow someone to die to now say, well, maybe we shouldn't have this person. You, you can't do that, but that's what, that's what occurs. And that's what's wrong with, you know, just the way things are. But as somebody who's gone through the system, has gone the other way, female police officers offer a different thing. They offer a calming effect. If sometimes I see Big yes, John sometimes me, no. And if I see Mrs. Mack coming at me, my that's inner... Because, that's because you're having different thoughts. You're thinking, you see Miss Mack coming at you, you're going, yeah, baby. Come no, <laughs> no. When I see Mrs. Mack coming at me, I have the natural uh, woman thing. Mom, you know, she's not going to mess with me. That's I mean, because I, you're a good guy. Yeah, but I, I, went, I got locked up and I yeah, never saw... Being, being locked up doesn't mean you're a bad guy. No, I understand there, that. There's, there's actually, in, in my opinion, there is about 2% of society, okay, that they're bad people. They're bad. Okay, that's 2%. And maybe I, it could be even less than that. There's, there could be 45% that have gone to jail. Those 40 some percent, they're not bad people. They just made a mistake. They and we mistake. all make mistakes. But I just made a felony mistake. <laughs> and you got caught for it. Yeah, there's there's plenty of people it. who haven't got caught. Oh, yeah. But you're going to get caught. You're Eventually. always going to get caught. If you continue to you're, do it, you're always going to get, get caught. caught. You're always going to get caught. You've you got to be an idiot not to think. That's why they give you the paroles and the long probation. When Chris Brown got the six-year probation, I knew that fucking moron was going to get in trouble again. I knew it. It doesn't take a fucking genius. But see, you, you look and you go, why do you know it? Because he thinks he's above everybody. He thinks that he's different. He's not different. He shits like everyone else. He freaking puts his pants legs on one, you know, one at a time. But he thinks he's different. And he should be able to be on a different standard. No, you're a person. You're an idiot. You hit a girl. You hit a pretty girl, a girl that you should be respecting and taking care of. I don't care if she got mad at you. I don't care if she pissed you off. She could have said that you're, the, you're, you're a terrible person. Doesn't mean that you should put your hands on her. You're not better than anybody. That's it's just a beautiful the way I fucking thing. No, it's uh, being a cop is a hard job, and, yep. and all the press that you see for a guy like me that's been on the other side, and I'm telling you that being a cop is like I've seen cops get jumped on. I've seen, I fucking seen it. I've seen how quick something happens. It yeah. happens fucking quick, Jack. There's no hold on. There's no bow. There's no <laughs> let me <laughs> grab your gear and flip you. There's nothing. It happens. It just you know, and you see it, and you have to react to it a certain way. And uh, I have a lot of res- I have a lot of respect for cops and teachers. I think that's the two hardest fucking jobs in society. They're tough. You got to deal with people. You have to make calls on the dime, and you're always gonna get criticized about that call, whether it's right or wrong. 
You know, whether it's right or wrong. They want teachers to have guns now. Really? They have want some teachers yeah, to get because licenses. Yeah, because you, you got idiots coming into schools yeah. that are armed trying to hurt, you know, people that are innocent people. Yeah, I could see putting, you know what? I don't have a problem with, a, you know, a, a good teacher that has had an established career that wants to be armed to help with security of someone that comes into their school. I don't have a problem. You know, I hate to say it. Everyone gets onto this fix about guns. And, you know, I could take a gun right now and put it in the middle of this table. And, you know, what? no one's going to get shot because the gun's not going to jump up and shoot anybody. It's only the idiot controlling it to shoot somebody. And, you know what? You can sit there and you can say, well, we're going to legislate and we're going to take it away. You can't take them away. They're out there. You know, to sit there and think that everyone has a registered weapon, you're an idiot. You know, anybody that wants to get something, they can get it. It's just, you know, it's out there. So if you think you're going to legislate, you know, those away, it's never going to happen. They will always have the ability to have that gun to go in. Now no one does have one. It's about educating people. It's about having people that sit there and, you know, a teacher that says, I would, I'd rather be armed. You know, look, I got friends that are pilots. You know, uh, there's a, you know, Mark Smith, who is a, you know, a uh, MMA referee working in, in uh, Nevada, works at UFC events. They, we're talking a guy here that was, you know, in the Air Force. He was on, on the Thunderbirds. All right, dude, you know, I mean, you realize what that is to get to that level of an F-16 fighter pilot that you're part of the Thunderbirds and stuff like that. And this guy is flying at Southwest. You know what? He should be armed. You know what? He's, he's not going to hurt anybody that doesn't need to be hurt, you know. You know, the, everybody that steps on that plane deserves protection from one idiot that wants to create an incident. And you know what? Sometimes it takes a guy, you know, that's in there that is armed. And if that's what it takes to arm a pilot, arm a, uh, a teacher that is a solid person in their job, do it. When you became a police officer in your heart, did you really think you'd make a difference? I always, I always kind of laughed at people that said, you know, I, I'm here to make a difference. And, yeah. you know, I, I, I just want to help people. I want to make a difference. And it's like, you know, for the most part, when people are contacted by police officers, it's a bad day. I don't care what it is. Either somebody did something to you that you're calling the police, and so something bad has happened, or the police are coming and they're knocking on your door, and now they're taking control and custody of you. It's a bad day. You know, police officers are there to keep the peace. They're there to make sure that crimes don't occur. They're there if a crime does occur, let's try to find the person that created that crime that's a problem, that is a problem for other people in our community so we can separate them from it and hopefully have the community be safe and, you know, from that person. That's what we're there for. But you're never going to be that person that, that people want to see because it's always a bad day that they're seeing you. It's, you know, I, it's just the way it is. You know, yeah, every now and then we get to, you know, I, I would go at Christmas time. I would go out and I'd have a bunch of stuffed toys and I would just stop my kids and I would, you know, let them come to my trunk and take, you know, a stuffed toy or something like that. That's a nice contact, but that's just not the reality of what being a police officer is. That's, uh, I know if I became a cop, it'd be to, to help, you know, just to really do the little things, little things that I don't see people doing anymore. Or cops doing anymore. I don't see that interaction with cops, especially in Los Angeles. Yeah. I don't see a lot of inter. I know no cops, you know. Now, there's another ref, but the pony isn't the guy a sheriff. Mike Beltran is the LA County Sheriff. A sheriff. And yeah. he's narcotics and all that stuff. Yep. Or something, right, right. Because yeah. I've had conversations with him. How did, now, before you became a cop, you got involved with jujitsu? No. I got involved with jujitsu when I was a police officer. I was, um, oh, let's see. I want to say back in 1990. One, ninety one or so. I had a friend that I did. He did judo, and I used to wrestle and I boxed. And we would work out. And you know, it, when it came to you know throwing, he couldn't throw me off of things. But if he put the gi on me, he could throw me. And he and he was the one that you know told me about this family from Brazil. He goes, "There's these guys. They're from Brazil. He goes, they like to fight on the ground. You would love them." He goes, "I, I can't think of it. They're down in the South Bay." He says, "They're out of a garage." And so I was like. Yeah, okay. And then I, you know, just through, I'd gone to do a lot of different martial arts and stuff. My dad growing up hated martial arts. My dad loved boxing and loved amateur wrestling. Professional wrestling, he would not let me watch. 
And I'd sneak it because he would never let me watch it because that's fake, that's bull, you know. My dad was all into what was he thought was real and what, you know, really worked in a fighting situation was big to him that his son did wrestling and boxing. And so that's what I grew up with. And then when I, uh, I ended up meeting Horry and Gracie, and I fell in love with jiu-jitsu. I, uh, the first guy that I ever rolled with was Hoyce. You know, that was my, f- my first go. And they said, well, what do you want to do? I said, whatever you want to do, you know. And he said, well, let's just roll first, you know. And I was on top, and I have him in a cradle. And I, you know, I, have, I, mean, I was like 290 pounds at the time, and he was, you know, 180 pounds. And I was like, these guys, I'm thinking to myself, this guy's nothing, you know. <laughs> and he's sitting there, and he's breathing, and I'm putting, a, I'm creating a lot of pressure, and I'm squeezing, and I'm, you know, driving my weight into him. And he's wiggling his leg, and he's moving and moving and moving. And he's, I end up taking my arm trying to move it out, and he, you know, tells me, he says, he, he gives me this line, and he says, and he's breathing like, ooh, ooh. and he goes, oh, my friend, you see movie Rocky. Right, and I kind of like, <coughs> relax. I'm like, is he talking to me? Right? And he says, everyone think he lose too. And within about a minute, he's got me in an arm bar. And, you know, I tap out of it because they told me, you know, if, you, if somebody's arse to hurt, tap out, you know, and like, okay. And I just looked at him, how'd you do that? Because I didn't know how he did it. You know, I knew that he swung his body around, but I was like, I was thinking I was going to take his back. And he's swinging all of a sudden, my arm was going straight. And I was like, how'd you do that? And I fell in love with it. And from that moment, I started going. And I started going just because it was something new, and it was this whole element of joint manipulations that I had never been experienced to. Some of the wrestling, you know, it, it intertwined with it, but theirs was totally different because wrestling, when you know I was taught to wrestle, it was a grind. It was about how hard I could drive into you, how much I could crush you, how much I could run you and make things hard it was what we called the grind and everything that they did was about oh my friend you work too hard (laughs) oh my friend take it easy relax you know and that was the part i was i had a hard time with because that was they kept on saying you you you, relax you're going too hard you know that's the only thing i knew how to do at the time and and i just was intrigued by it and i stayed with it i just loved it and you still go no, no, no. I mean, you know. You got, you got the black belt, though. You teach yeah. and everything still. Yeah. Still into the academy. Eventually, I got a black belt, but that's just, you know, I think that more out of like, it's kind of like the actor that never won anything. And they say, yeah, you acted. Here, here's a reward for lifetime achievement. <laughs> and so, I, you know, I look at it. It's, I, I could roll, you know, I, I know what I'm doing. I know how to teach someone. I love jujitsu. I got to a point, I didn't care about the black belt. I really didn't. And I looked at it was, my idea was, were it's not about the belt it's about because you know and the, and the reason i was saying that you know i was you know with guys and i was at, at that time you know even early ufc's i was rolling i was rolling with all the fighters and you know mark coleman i rolled with mark coleman that dude was so freaking strong and such a beast he didn't have a belt well he's an olympic level wrestler but he got no belt so was, uh, at a certain point i was like i don't care about the belt it's about how well you do it's about what you know. It's about how well you can do it. It's about how well you can make somebody else do it. And that's, you know, eventually, you know, I got the belt. And that's nice. But then it's just a giant target on your back. And everyone wants to tap you out. So if you put on a gi and you, and you, and you go on the thing, it's like, you know, everyone's like, oh, I want to roll with you. Oh, okay. And it's like, here, let's go. All right? And they're going, they're going well, well, go hard. And I said, no, go. There we go. And I do that. And I tap real quick, right? And they go, well, what are you doing? I said, well, you, I know you wanted to tap me. So there it was. So now let's roll. Right? And so it's like. I have a good time with it. I love the sport. I love jujitsu because it changed my life. It really did. And it calmed me down. It, the one thing that it really did is it, it changed who I was as far as, you know, importance of, I, for years, I was that guy that, you know, I walked around and I'm a, I'm a nice person. I like everybody. But if you gave me that look, I would be the first one to, to look back and I'm, I'm going to start to target you because that was who I was. And the jiu-jitsu changed me. It was like, who cares? Yeah, yeah, you can beat me, whatever, you know. But it really changed who I was. It calmed me down. It made me uh, a lot better person. 
it's doing that for me. I'm terrible. See? I don't have a belt, and I don't want a belt. It I doesn't just go matter. to breathe. I just go to breathe. And to I'm, I'm all about people wanting to achieve. And if that belt is what you think is your achievement point that you want, awesome, do it. Let's go from white to blue to purple to brown to black. I don't care. That's great. You know, there's just certain people. You know, BJ got his black belt in four years. I have a girl, you know, that's been with me at my gym, you know, forever. Felicia, oh, she got hers in four years, three and a half years. Got hers even faster than BJ. And she was phenomenal and was a phenomenal competitor and, you know, just did an incredible job. But it's not about that. It's not about getting to that point. It's about the journey. That's what's important. And it's what you learn during that journey and the amount of time and effort that you put into that journey and the, the routes that it takes you and the people that you meet and the things that occur, that's what the life of being a martial artist and, and studying whatever it is, whether it's jiu-jitsu or judo or you know, kempo or whatever it is you like, that's why you do it. It's not to be the guy that you know, can go out and beat up anybody. Or something. You know, look, at, there's always gonna be, that. like I said before, there's always somebody out there that's gonna whip your ass. That is just the way it is. And if you think that that's going to be what's going to cover your butt, you know, a black belt, great. You know, I think Hoy said it best, a black belt covers about two inches of your ass. And there's a whole lot exposed. So, you know, you, you need to understand that it's about experiencing a system and a lifestyle that calms you, centers you, makes you just a better person. That's what I think it's about. Well, it, it enhanced my comedy. It's made me way better as a comic. I see something. How did it do that? You got to tell me on that last. <clears throat> to me, when I first rolled onto Jiu Jitsu, I was 49 years old. I'm still overweight. When I first did a hip escape, I thought my fucking, I thought I was going to die. When I was first told to do that first hip escape yeah. down that roll, I thought I was going to die. I had never established. And I played tackle football. I played high school basketball. I did it all. I thought that that was just amazing. I thought I was going to die. I, the first three times I went to jiu-jitsu, I thought I was going to die. I really did. There were parts where I was like, I can't believe I'm doing this. This is ridiculous. I got to take aspirins and write a will <laughs> if I keep coming to this shit because I'm going to fucking die. But uh, I liked it so much, like, and I was so bad at it, and it brought me back to comedy. When you first get into comedy, after about a year, you're stuck, and you're like, I, I, want, I can't wait to perform at the punchline. I can't wait, but you can't. You can't. There's no, you're not ready. You, yeah. And you're frustrated. And that's what I am now. It frustrates me. There's times I'm like, fuck it, I'm not going to go because I'm never going to get better. But it's like, I got to go to get better. When I walk outside jujitsu and, and I say this in front of Mrs. Mack, I got the biggest dick in the world. When I finish an hour and a half class, me, for me. Feel good about yourself. Uh, it's so it's fucking hard for me. When they grab me and I'm on the bottom and a, a guy's bead falls in my eye and his sweat's burning my fucking eye and I can't breathe and I don't know. And that, it, to me, is where you want to be put every day because everything else seems easy. Nothing. Traffic go. on the 405, bitch. I had a 200-pound guy going from my fucking neck for an hour and a half. I got to look straight ahead for three weeks. I can't even look. You know, uh, <laughs> These little things, when I walk out of jiu-jitsu, you can't stop me. That hour, that's that's better than cocaine. It's yep. better than sex. It's better than anything I've because I know how hard it is for me. I know how hard it is for me. I see twenty year olds, fucking dying, drenched, sweating. So I know a fifty two year old doing it that's a hundred pounds away and that's never done it. If I would have wrestled in high school in two years of college, okay, I would have had some basics. I know, you know, I get somebody with neon belly. I go for a fucking ride. You know, Hegan loves neon belly, neon belly. <laughs> How many times I've landed on my fucking Hegan's head? Hegan's a load, too. <laughs> yeah, oh, my God, but I'll go back. And I said it on the Rogan podcast that this, to me, uh, I know I'm, I suck now. I'm horrible at fucking jiu-jitsu. Oh, it doesn't God. matter. But it doesn't matter to no. me. Because I know I'm going to get better. Just like it makes me doing the comedy for all those years taught me that I could do this. It's just going to click one day. It might take three years. It might take six years. It might take eight years, but one day it's all going to come together. The movements, the the, the, the fucking sweeps, I'm going to get it. Now you get on top of me, it takes me 20 minutes to think about. By the time the bell goes off, I still didn't. What was I supposed to do? I don't <laughs> fucking know. Let me give some shout-outs real quick. And, oh, shit, Lisa. Yeah, how you feeling? Good, right? I'm good, buddy. It's a beautiful day to be alive. You're with the Jews. 
I want to get, get remind me of something. I got to tell you about this thing I watched the other day, this documentary, because it had to do a lot with the police. Sean Jones, I love you, cocksucker. Paul Lynch, Renee Encarcion, the Puerto Ricans, Lister Thomas, Paul Cresta, 2323, Philip Fletcher, Don Wrangler, and Eric Castaneda. I love you, cocksuckers. Have a great week. Anybody see a documentary robbed? No. Oh, shit. What's it about? Oh. It's about Jim. It's about Norton, Ken Norton, and Muhammad Ali. Oh. The third fight. Third fight? At Bronx, in the Bronx. That was at, that was at Yankee Stadium. Yankee Stadium. Horrible. Oh, my God. Oh. Norton won. I, dude, Norton I can remember won. watching that fight, and I was like, I couldn't believe they gave it to Ali. Ali could crying. not handle Norton's style. Oh, my God. Norton was hitting him. Yep. If you think LeVar Johnson hits fucking hard. <laughs> oh, my God. Norton was big, athletic, and his technique. That overhand right he was throwing was fucking brutal. You could hear it. Just every time he hit his arms or something, you could just hear it. But it wasn't what was going on in the stadium. That's what this documentary is about. It was about what was going on outside the stadium with the New York Police Department. Oh, yeah. How they couldn't handle it. Oh, you got to see this I shit. I got to watch it. So what happened was all these people, you know, to, to get a ticket to go see a boxing match, you know, 1970, it was still 50 bucks. 50 bucks is a lot of money. 100 bucks was like 1,000 now, you know. So all these people came up from the suburbs, and they basically they just went up there to get robbed. And there were so many people getting robbed. It was the time with the Warriors, all those gangs in New York. Oh, yeah. So all these gangs were there robbing people. And there's a part where uh, the, the, the newscaster, the, the guy goes, I remember being outside and people getting taken down and yelling for the police. But the police were so overwhelmed. They were just turning their backs to people. Uh, so you oh, my God. I, I couldn't do that. No, me neither. I don't know couldn't what. Do how, the, the one cop goes, there was a point where there were 75 people and I was there by myself. Cops were all over running, breaking up fights. The people were t taking cars. He goes, it was just one of the worst nights ever in New York. But it wasn't about the fight. It was about all these people that had just been humiliated, robbed. Just They, they took their jewelry, their cash wow. on the way out because the cops hadn't planned for it. Like, they had never really... Bob Arum was the promoter. Bob Arum was crying in it. He's like, I felt terrible. He goes, first I got this Ken Norton crying. Ken Norton was fucking crying. He's a man, a grown man, bigger than LeVar Johnson. I keep saying LeVar Johnson. Is that his name? Yeah. LeVar Johnson. He's not in the UFC no more. No, he's a uh, Bellator. Bellator, nah. He fucking he used this guy. But him. Uh, Good guy. Gorilla. He got shot. He's a Compton oh, boy. Oh, yeah. yeah, he got shot. He's a Compton family one. At a family family party. <laughs> it was at a family party. I think it was in Fresno. And oh, he, wasn't here. He's not from down here? No, he's from uh, Fresno area, and he was up uh, just at a party and. People drove by and words exchanged, and he got shot. You were also here for the heyday of gangs. Oh, yeah. You really think about it. Absolutely. Now, when I did time in Colorado, I did time with a Crip. Mm -hmm. Really, really, and I know you're looking at me crazy, really good guy. <laughs> really good guy. I mean, I really liked this kid. He was just a young kid. He had grown up in Compton, and that's all he knew, drugs. Well, you, you know what? Look that's at all it. he knew. Man. Absolutely. You know, what, what people don't understand is, and I would get kids, it's... They're stuck because they're going to school. They don't want to be part of a gang, and every day at school they're getting they're getting brutalized. They're getting beat up. They're getting their stuff taken, and they're getting it done by gang members. And there's one way to keep it from happening: either be part of that gang or part of the gang that is going to protect you from. Them. And eventually they just succumb to it and say, "I need I need help." And those people are to them their family at the time, and they start to do it, and then. Things occur out of it, and they start making bad decisions because they have to. You know, if you want to be part of the gang, you're going to have to do certain things, and you're going to sell drugs, and you're going to rob, and you're going to do some things that are not good. And, you know, I had – there's all kinds of people, you know, that I ran into, and not all of them are bad. They may, may be a gang member, but they're not all bad. They just make poor decisions, and those poor decisions affect their lives and sometimes for the rest of their life. You were here for colors, also, right? Oh yeah. Oh shit. Oh yeah. Colors. That was when I was I was working gangs when colors came out. Now all my friends are in that stupid movie. Now the guy that they based that off of, that they based it off a certain cop or something like that. No, they based it off a of South Bureau Crash, which was you know, Crash was, you know, our acronym for our gang unit. It was Community Resources Against Street Hoodlums. What a! 
everything in LAPD had been some stupid acronym, but that was what the crash was. And uh, they, uh, Sean Penn became friends with a friend of mine named Dennis Fanning. He did the show. Yeah. He did the podcast. He did the oh, really? podcast. Yeah, that's yeah. how I met him. I and, met him. And he, uh, you know, he became friends with Dennis, and Dennis was part of South Bureau Crash at the time, and to start talking to him, and then took him on a ride along, and that's how the whole thing really started. And he became, he was, you know, the main star of the show and stuff. But all, there's a lot of guys. Dennis is in the movie. He's he's in there a couple of times and stuff. So I make fun of him. He's from Chicago originally. You know, just a tough, you know, thick-headed Irishman, just like you know other guys I know. <laughs> but. Uh, you know, Dennis was uh, just a great guy, and, and Penn just f- fell in love with him as far as what he did as a police officer out on the streets. You know, you take, you know, I, I took quite a few star, stars out on ride-alongs, we would call them. They would go out and actually, you know, see us work. And there was ones that were hysterical. You know, I can't remember the one guy's name. He was in, uh, there was the movie with Richard Gere, where he was, a, uh, I want to say. Internal Affairs. Internal Affairs, yeah. He was the, he was the, the husband of the wife that Richard was doing, and he came out and, and I scared him to death. Andy Garcia. No, it wasn't. It was the other guy. One Cassavetes is his name, last name. I can't think of his first name. Nick. But, yeah, I want to say Nick Cassavetes. And and he was, you know, he went out and ride along with me and, and watching what we were doing, and we got into a little pursuit. And, and he says, he goes, "That's it. You got to take me back. I can't take this. I'm going to have a heart attack out here." <laughs> and, you know, and it was. You know, you drive fast. You sometimes it's scary. Sometimes it's fun. But the the adrenaline rush is what makes you go back. It's it's you have scary days, John. Oh sure, absolutely. Anyone? Shot at? Absolutely. No shit. Oh yeah. No one hit me though, so I'm good. <laughs> you see people's reaction when a gun goes off? Is it fucking crazy when the cop isn't prepared for that? You know what? You need to always you know, you always need to be in a position where. You don't get surprised by a lot, and there's times when it can happen because you, you can get into what we call ambush situations, and you can drive into something, and it can it can shock you. But you know, to sit there and say, you know, don't be afraid, that's stupid. You know, there's certain emotions that we all have, and you know, I talk about fear all the time, and I don't care if it's fear of a situation, a person, whatever it's going to be. Fear is a normal thing. You know, it's a good thing. It helps you. It makes you aware. It tells you something's wrong here. There are other emotions that are out there, like panic. That's a stupid emotion. If you panic, uh, you're, you're, you're relying on an emotion that's going to do absolutely nothing for you and is going to only lead you into, be- into a worse situation. So, you know, people talk about being courageous and heroes and all that stuff. You know, to me, a courageous person, you know, there's no courageous people that didn't have fear because if you weren't afraid, there's nothing to be courageous about. So it's, you know, you, you go and you do certain situations and you, you, you walk out of it. And it's one of the reasons where a lot of people sit there and they'll, they'll talk about, oh, police officers make you know, fun of things. They joke. You have to, you know, because things occur and you got to laugh about them. Or you got to make jokes about them because you see things. You know, there, there's a certain again, element of society that, you know, does things to other people that you end up having to see the end results of it. And it's a nasty world at times. And, you know, the average person will never see those things. And, you know, sometimes you got to make jokes because it's your only way of dealing with it because it's no different than being in, you know, uh, military personnel and going down downrange and seeing things. You know, the average person has no idea what those military personnel people are, are doing, what they're seeing. You know, to have a friend that you're talking to and the next thing is, you know, there's an explosion going off and you see pieces of them you know, and they're screaming out. Those are things that you, you just don't forget. You just, it doesn't leave your mind. It's not, oh, we move on to the next day. They stay with you forever. And there's certain things as a police officer, they're going to stay with you forever. Things that you see, things that you do. Some you're proud of, some you're not. That's just, that's just part of the job. So what I, makes you go back then? Like if you see like your friend blown up or someone shoots at you, if that were me, I'd be f- f- applying for car dealerships or anything like that. That's okay. But you know what? And again, look, it's no different than, look, there, there is, like I said, there's a rush. And everyone, everybody's different. You know, there's, there's people that are out there that, you know, I love excitement. I like doing what other people think are scary. It's yeah. not scary to me. You know, fighters, you look at people, you know, people look at fighters and they go, oh, my God, you know, 
I couldn't imagine, you know, knowing I was going to get in a fight and stuff because they look at it in their own world and they're scared to death of a physical confrontation with another human being because they know they've kind of had it happen. They've had that feeling that rush of adrenaline has gone through them and all of a sudden they're shaking and they can't stop it. And they go, why would anyone want that? And they think that's what the fighter gets, you know, and that's not what a professional fighter gets. The fight, the fighters doing things different, but the fighter gets a drug. And this is why a lot of them can't stop is when you walk out into an arena that's got 17, 20,000 people and all of a sudden the lights go down and this music comes on, it's your music and you're bouncing and all of a sudden you're coming out and everyone's wanting to touch you, everyone's screaming your name, everything is going off. It is a drug that you can get nowhere else. And you can't bottle it, you can't smoke it. It is a drug that only they understand. And when they stop doing it, the drug goes away. And that's why you see a lot of them going back. Well, it's the same thing with sometimes with police work, depending upon what kind of officer you are and what you're doing. 98% of it is boredom. But 2%, that if, you're, if you're a hardworking cop and you're getting into things, that 2%, that's a drug. And if you're that guy that likes that drug, you always want to go back to it. You know, putting away somebody for me would be a great day, saving somebody's life. Well, a cat out of a fucking tree, you know, <laughs> uh, talking to a kid that got bullied. That Those would be the things that would make my day as a cop. But that's know? good. You that's know, good. That's making yeah, a kid a feel good. And, you know, and again, it's, you know, it's like everyone looks at, you know, bullying. It's God damn. I mean, everybody, I don't care who everybody has been bullied. bullied. If they say no, they're lying. I was bullied. I bullied people, I'm sure. You know, there's people. I actually went to a high school, a 30 year high school reunion, so I could tell a guy, hey, I just want to tell you, I'm sorry. I was a turd. You know, and he didn't show up. And then I see him. I'm, I actually see him at a fight. He comes up and he says, John, right? And I tell him, I said, dude, I just want to tell you, man, hey, I'm sorry for the way I treated you. And he goes, you were awesome to me, right? And I'm like, no, I was a shithead. And he goes, N -n -n I don't remember that. I go, glad you don't remember it, because I do. I was a turd. <laughs> but, you know, everyone is bullied because that's it's part of human nature if you know kids you know you watch them and they start if they can start to dominate something they do it's what happens and it's to sit there and tell you know people oh we we've got we've got this new problem it's not a new problem it's been going on for centuries the only thing i would say is and it's because I, I went through it and I, i'm the biggest i'm not anti-technology anti-internet at all i love i'm the biggest nerd in the world but if i had to go through some of the stuff i went through and w w wasn't able to go home and get away from it. If like I was going online and c and seeing it more and more at night, I can see why people get upset. And I, I the kids k killing themselves is a lot more drastic than I would ever think. I wouldn't do. But if it's nonstop all weekend, all night, I can see where that where that online. You mean? Yeah, like Facebook and instant messaging and. But that's and, why there's karate. And but you know and that, that there you go. See and this is what. For that kid that you're talking about, you're right. It seems like it's everything. Right. It's their world. Their world is falling apart, and they have no idea how to stop it. And it's, you know, the one thing I love out of my gym is, you know, the kid program. And all the kids that I have had, you know, I've been open now for eight, nine years. And some of these kids I've had since they were, you know, four years old, five years old. And now they're, you know, they're young men. They don't have problems. Now, you know, part of it is we tell them, if I ever find out you are doing things to other people just because you can, I'm going to fall on you. I'm just telling you straight out. Your job is to protect those people. Your job is to be the guy that tells everyone, hey, let him be. And put your arm around and say, it's okay, don't worry about it. Man. I'm always, hey, I'll be your friend. That's your job. But the kids that I have, they have such confidence because they know they know that if someone does do something, they're not alone. They they know that they can do something. Now I'm not. The, they're not supposed to go out and and do it. But I have I have one. I have. A, there's a kid who's been in my gym forever. He just as a freshman in high school. I was lucky enough to get wrestling going in the Santa Clarita Valley, where I lived for a long time. It's where my gym's at because for 30 
38, 39 years. It was no wrestling in that valley. Great football, everything. No wrestling. It took me forever to get wrestling back in that valley. This is the first year they have had an actual one high school. Valencia High has a wrestling team for the first year. They came in second in their uh, in the, the freelance league, which is everybody together, which allowed them to put four kids to CIF. And one of the kids, as a freshman, just took second. He got beat by a senior who was ranked second in the state in the last minute of the third round. And so this is a freshman. Now, this kid is phenomenal. And he, everything he has learned, he's learned at my place, but he is confident in everything he does. He's got a sister that is gorgeous, and she's being bullied. And she can, her parents brought her in to me for me to sit down and talk to her and talk to her about, look, at, this is what you need to do. This is what you and, I, and I, I brought up her brother. I said, I said, tell me, how many people... You know, I said, your, your brother's younger. How many people are picking on Chance? She goes, nobody. They're all afraid of him. I go, why? Because he picks on him? She goes, no, they just know. I go, he has confidence. I want you to have confidence too. Because the more confident you are as far as who you are as a person, it doesn't mean you have to be confident that you can beat people up. But the more confident about who you are as a person and what you stand for, the better off you're going to be in everything you do. That's why the jiu-jitsu is helping me with that. That's somebody. exactly it. That's why. That's it. Let me give a shout-out to sponsors. We'll get you out of here, John. John, that was, you know, listen, man. I'll get you back here again, and we'll talk oh, MMA man. bullshit. But for right now, I want to get It was to nice not talking yeah, about MMA. Yeah, no, bullshit. that's what I figured. I figured you talk about MMA every fucking day of the week, or jiu-jitsu. Let's talk about the police thing. It was very interesting to me. And I, when I saw that, I thought you were a cop from 91 on. I could. Because I was just telling Lee when OJ killed his wife, I was living in Boulder, and I was going through a divorce, and I wanted to kill that bitch. So him. I was watching this whole OJ thing very fucking closely to see how I was going to get away with my fucking murder. See if I was going to use a Bronco yeah. or maybe a Blazer. That, to me, uh, you know, I've read all those books. I wanted to be, before I got my felony, John, I wanted to be a lawyer. I, 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 got, it in, in, uh, I got into the University of Colorado. And as a Latin, they would have you know, let me into a law school. I would have had to take a test. And then I got the felony and I got in trouble. So I read all those things. I read uh, the, the Tupac book out of Rampart. I, I read all the OJ information I could. I, I watched Law and Order. That's my favorite fucking show of all time. You know, uh, when, I, when my mother died, I, grew, I moved in with a family. And, and the middle child was a cop. I, I hung out with the younger guy. But the middle guy sold pot when we were kids. And I was always tight with him. And one day he became a cop. He cleaned up his life and became a cop. And he had the 12 to 8 shift. And he would tell me, I get bored out there. You want to ride around? And I would. he would pick me up at 12. I was a sophomore in high school. I'd go buy a, a, a six-pack of Coors Light. And I'd just sit in his car and I'd drink in the beers. He'd be with the speed gun seeing the cars go by. And he'd go, 80, what do you think? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> 78, what do you think? Nah. And then he would. If he got a bad call. He was he would drop me off and he would go do it. But uh, I've always had, even though I had trouble growing up, I always had a certain respect for cops. And I like hearing about it. I want to see your side of the fucking fence. You know, I mean, uh, it's funny you said that about when we get pulled over and we think, I robbed a jewelry store one time, okay? Before we robbed the jewelry store, the jewelry was going to go in the trunk. But when we robbed the jewelry store, the trunk wouldn't fucking open. <laughs> Wouldn't fucking open. Now we got this thing of jewelry. The people are going, run back, call the police. Ah. And we throw the jewelry in the set in the in the uh, back, back seat. seat. My friend sitting in the one guy sits here, one guy sits here. I sit in the back seat. I can't even see my feet. It's covered with all the jewelry. We're pulling away. We hear the sirens coming. We pull up to a red light and we see a cop coming at us. And he stops with a red light, even though his things are on because he's got things. And all of a sudden, you hear chick chick. And the trunk just opened up by itself right in front of the cop. I'm like, they're going to fucking pull us over now. The guy just went right through. We, we, we didn't get away with it. <laughs> we got picked up weeks later. One night I was driving around with a friend of mine, and we were fucking tanked. And we had a spackle bucket. We were 18. We had a spackle bucket, and we were drinking. He wasn't drinking, but I was drinking with my buddies in the car. He was like, a, he had a hepatitis or some shit, so he couldn't drink. So we were snorting coke and getting fucked up. It was 5 in the morning. Cop pulled us over. He's looking in the back seat. I mean, I thought we were going to, I would have just been getting out of jail now. And all of a sudden, he got a call. And he goes, just drive fucking slower next time. And he took off and we're like, Whew. So, you never know. Sometimes you do, 
I mean, I don't know how many times I'll see lights and just from my normal, me being me, claiming responsibility, I go, that guy's going to pull me over because he probably saw me looking at my phone <laughs> three blocks down. I have a panic attack whenever there's sirens oh in the God. song. Like in a song, like a lot of rap songs that have sirens in it. And I freak out on like when I'm driving late. Oh, it's terrifying. <laughs> When you hear a siren in a song, you don't know it's supposed to be in there, <laughs> and you're looking around, it's fucking loud. I want to give a shout out to my main people over at Onnit.com, optimizing motherfuckers with their ready minerals and all the stuff they got to make you better. Like I've said it a thousand times, man, if you go into a Chinese restaurant and the pork fried rice sucks, everything else is going to suck, right or wrong. On it, their alpha brain is their trademark. It's the whole show. It's the whole kabang. It's got a hundred a hundred percent money back guarantee, and we don't even want the fucking pills back. So if it don't help you, hundred percent guarantee, and take it from there. If as far as minerals are concerned, I'll get you ten percent off. The weights, the battle ropes, you're on your fucking own. Go to onit.com in the box. Lee Presley. Church. Church, bitches. C H U R C H, and get ten percent off. They also have the Stay On It program. It gets delivered right to your house. Is Joe giving any of that stuff yet? No, no. Somebody just called me the other day and said, you got to talk to Joe to give me some mushroom tech. Those fucking mushrooms make me go crazy when I'm rolling. He's 50, and the guy goes, I roll for three hours on those fucking quadricep mushrooms. <laughs> They're called shroom tech. Sport, and uh, he has sport or immune. And the sport, supposedly, man, fucking people go crazy on those things. Like They just it. roll for hours. Uh, Iron Dragon TV. Classic martial art films, Yip Man, what's the other guy? Jackie Chan. Jackie Chan. Tai Chi Hero. Tai Chi Hero. They just keep adding on titles, 4K technology. Iron Dragon TV has got it going on. If you look into classic martial art films, go to Iron Dragon TV. If you mention my name, what do you put in the box? Joey. Joey. J-O-E-Y. You get two free movies for free. These guys got 30 years of martial art films there. This martial art thing started in 1968, and these guys got all the films. Mafia films, one-armed swordsmen, shit like that. Go to irondragontv.com today. Again, you thinking of quitting smoking? He hit cigarettes. Hit e-cigs. Hit e-cigarettes. What the fuck? What is it? Hit e-cigs. Hit e-cigs.com right now. They got the cigar. I don't know where the hell it is. I got to bring some more from the house. And they got the little e-pens you could smoke. E-cigarettes. E-cigarettes you could smoke from 24 milligrams down to zero if you're thinking of quitting. Go to hitty6.com and press in. Joey's Church. Oh, shit. And get 20% off your first order. Also, nailedlife.com. They ain't fucking around with their wax. Go to nailedlife.com. Oil and, look and at wax. The oil and wax. Go to the page and see what they got to offer you. Also, on the vapor pen, you get 20% off. And that's how we do Put it. Put in Joey Diaz. That's right. J-O-E-Y-D-I-A-Z. Don't forget, I'm at Crackers Thursday. The following week, I'm in Hilarities in Cleveland. And the following week, I'm in Sacramento. But let's just worry about fucking Indianapolis this weekend. Bring your snorkels, cocksuckers. It's going deep. Where are you this weekend? I gotta, I gotta Next weekend, I got to go to Connecticut for uh, Bellator on Friday. And then I got to get my ass back here for the UFC on Saturday. So you're doing Saturday. You're doing Lilith Fair. Friday, Friday and Saturday. As they're doing it. They're calling it Lilith Fair. Lilith Fair. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the guy's MMA junkie calling it. Uh, That's it, my brother. That's it. All B- right. Big John. Hey, who thank loves you. you more than me? Thank you very much, man, for doing this for me. On my Sunday. pleasure, brother. I've been dying to get you on, and uh, I'm happy you came down. Very interesting police stories. I love all these. It's shit. very cool because it's a it's a big hot button issue right now, and a lot of people are, have a lot of negative things to say, and a lot of it's warranted when you see some of the videos. A lot of the some cops of are it being, is, but it's you don't get to hear the other point of view. If you've known me on the show, I always talk about something, and I've never brought it up because. Before I could judge it, I got to be in that fucking car. I don't know what, what happened in St. Louis. I know kind of what happened in Staten Island with the guy yeah, that choked him. I didn't like that one. Either. I didn't like that one. In St. Louis, I don't know what happened. And it's like anything, you know, it's their word against mine, mine against theirs. Who the fuck knows? Right. Uh, half the people didn't know Michael Brown. They're out there looting again. You know, it's an excuse to do, It's it's you know, uh, what, what's the old saying, adage that our moms just say, two wrongs don't make a right. That's true. And that's what these things add up to be. At least that's what I see. But anyway, who gives a fuck what I see? Big John, Mrs. Mack, I love you. Looking good with the new hair. Look at you. You're a savage. I, oh, not new hair, but you let it grow out. It looks fucking sensational, and you smell good, too. Lee Syatt, don't forget, it snowed in fucking Israel. Did it really? Yeah, oh, it snowed in Jerusalem. Yeah, it's oh, like, in Jerusalem? Wow, that's like in the middle. Yeah, wow. Right by the fucking cross right there. What do you got? What do you, What's that? Almost. Almost. When are you? What do you got today? 
Today I got nothing. I got a, a blog coming out tomorrow. Okay. So thank thank you. I got a lot of nice emails about the blog and the podcast. Who, so thank who you. Who takes care of you like me? Don't, 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 don't I fucking tell you this shit. I love you guys. See you Tuesday at 3. We got a gang member Tuesday at 3. There you go. So we're going to balance this motherfucker out this week, all right? Stay black. Have a great week. Start your Monday off on the right foot. Stay black, people. Go to onnit.com and use code word CHURCH to get 10% off of all of their optimization products like Alpha Brain, New Mood, Shroom Tech Immune, Shroom Tech Sport. Go to hitesigs.com and uh, better tasting, longer lasting, proof is in the vape. Use code word Joey's CHURCH to get 20% off. Go to irondragontv.com and use code word Joey to get two free rentals. And go to uh, nailedalive.com and use code word Joey Diaz to get 20% off the premier vapor pen on the market.